All right. Hey, let's go ahead and get going here this morning. Go ahead and turn with me in your Bibles to the book of Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews chapter 11. I want to share briefly with you a few thoughts, something that the Lord has been stirring up in my heart this week. And, and uh, it's, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a little bit here, it's a little bit there. And hopefully this will all just kind of speak to you by the Spirit today. Because uh, I, I wouldn't say that I have uh, so much of a practical uh, message for you as much as I, I just feel like the Lord wants to speak some, some individual things to your family and to your home and to your marriage and, and, and to, to your future, to what it is that He has in store door for you. You know, we sang that song here this morning that you are my future and my past. And there's so many of us that, that live in this place of we've trusted the Lord to deal with our past and we've trusted the Lord to bring us into our future. But what's in the middle is the today. It's the right now. It's, it's, it's the, it's the right now. You know, one, one thing that I've noticed about Christians is that we have a tendency to like to kick the can down the road, so to speak. We like to say, well, tomorrow, well, tomorrow, but what happens when tomorrow becomes today? What happens when tomorrow becomes today? What's God saying to you today? And this is why we need absolutely it's vital more than you need breath. What did Jesus say? He said, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. There is a proceeding word of God that he's speaking to you and to your life on a daily basis. And he wants us to learn how to live on his word, not just, you know, reading the Bible, but hearing his voice. What is God saying to me today? Because that is the only way to live in the now. It's the only way to live into not just thankful for what God did in the past, looking forward to what what God's going to do in the future, but missing what he's doing right now, right here today. Amen. You with me? And so today is, it, it, we can't kick the can till tomorrow. We're going to say tomorrow become today. I want today to be the day that I hear the voice of the Lord. And that's my desire for you, that you would hear the voice of God today, that you would hear his heart and his will for your life today. And that's what we're going to talk about. So Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6. I'm going to read this scripture and then we're going to pray and I'm going to show you a few other things. It says this verse six, but without faith, it is impossible to please him for he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Without faith, it's impossible to please him for he who comes to God, what must believe that he is must believe that that he is, not that he will be, not that he was, but it says he must believe that he is, that God is in the middle of your situation, that God is present in your life today, that God is noticing those things that are going on in your world when you don't see him, when you don't feel him, when you don't, uh, when it, you're not, it doesn't seem like God's involved in your situation. God says, I am there. And, and we must believe that he is is. You see what I'm saying? We can't, we can't say, oh, well, we know that God was doing this, or we know that God one day will do this. I'm tired of living in that way, guys. I want to live in the, what is he doing right now in my life in this time? He is, amen. I want to live the kind of he is faith. I want to live the kind of he is life. I don't want, I don't want when somebody comes up to me and says, you know, how's things going, man? What's going on in your life? And, and I, I don't just want to have stories about what happened in February. Yeah. Or, and, and, and e, as equally, I don't want to have just, well, one day God's going to, I mean, those are wonderful. You need to hang on to those, but what's he doing today? Where is he at in your life today? He is come on now. Watch this. It says he who comes to God must believe that he is, you got to get that inside of you. I got to have him today. He is. And that he, come on, say it. You can do it. He, that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Now is, is it talking about in the, in the sweet by and by the pie in the sky, or is it still talking about the is that means today God wants to reward you for diligently seeking him? Come on. This is a, this is a whole new world we're in. 
Because we're not just talking about what he used to do, and we're not just talking about what he's going to do. We're talking about what does he want to do today, right now, in this moment, in this time in my life. Because if you don't live in the is, then you're always going to be either looking back or looking ahead, but you're never going to see where he is right now. We miss so many things that God wants to do because we're steady looking back or looking forward. And God says, I'm right in front of you. I am in front of you. I am doing a work in your day right now. Right now. He is. Amen. He is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Now skip over just a little bit. I want to show you something here in, in uh, same chapter, Hebrews chapter 11, verse 17. There's a, a, a patriarch that's mentioned here that I want to draw some, uh, just draws a few things from his life. And, and I believe this is going to help you. So it says this by faith, Abraham when he was tested, offered up Isaac and he who had received the promises offered up his only begotten son of whom it was said in Isaac, your seed shall be called concluding that God was able to raise him up even from the dead from which he also received him in a figurative sense. Now we're going to take that apart here in just a minute and talk about it. But the first thing I want to draw your attention to, it says by faith, Abraham, when he was tested. Now here's the thing we got to, we got to get past this. So let me, let me deal with this and then we're going to move on. Okay. The, the bottom line is, is that nobody likes the test. Nobody likes to be tested right? Nobody likes the test. The test is not fun. The test is not what we signed up for, but you know what? Really, when it comes down to it, the test is what causes us to become who he's called us to be. It's what creates in us the, 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 the person who God has created us to be. It's the test. He uses the test to, pro, to, to bring us into our true identity. Okay. So, so let me, let me get beyond this for just a second. I remember when I was in high school, um, I, I, I didn't enjoy the test because the test provoked me. It, it made me have to, to, to put in the work to prepare for the test, right? When I was in school, you had to put in the, the work to prepare for the test. And I remember playing football and man, I, I didn't necessarily enjoy those two a day football practices in the, you know, in the South Louisiana heat is 110 degrees outside and we've got on full pads and we're bear crawling the length of the football field and just like, you know, sweating almost drops of blood like Jesus did in the garden. I mean, it's terrible. It's awful. We had a, we had a sled that was like a homemade, come on, you guys know what I'm talking about. Y'all had some of those in, in school. Some of our, our men here, you know what I'm talking about. It was at home. I don't even know if they would allow them to use this. And somebody got sued and they quit using these. I promise it had to have. This was a homemade piece of iron and it was slapped together by somebody who thought it'd be a good idea to push it around. And we'd have to push this thing. It was painted red and, and they named it Satan. There's this, this sled and we'd have to push it. We had to push it the length of the field and then we turn around and push it back. We had to push Satan all over that place. That's prophetic right there. But anyway, but, but I was thinking about what was the whole point of that? It's preparation. You know, last Sunday we, we talked about everybody that was here last Sunday. Remember we talked about when Paul and Silas were in the prison and when they were in the prison, there was all of the, this word kept coming out. It kept saying, and, and immediately, and immediately, and immediately. And it really frustrates me whenever I think about the word immediately, because I realized something that there's really no such thing as immediately. Immediately aren't real. It says immediately, but actually there was something that prepared that immediately. And before that immediately came, something else had to go through a process to make way for that immediately. Like, you know what I'm talking about? When, when they got in that prison and they were in there and they got beat and they got shackled to the floor and they got spit on and cussed out and their beards ripped out and, 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 and all this terrible stuff happened to them. They threw them in that prison and chained them up. And then they said about midnight, they started singing. They started praying. All the prisoners started listening to them. Next thing you know, there's an earthquake and it says and immediately the doors were open. And I look at it and go, what kind of immediately is that? Because really th that didn't just happen immediately. There was a shaking that started long before the shaking started. 
There was something going on that caused those men, even in the face of terror and in the face of being uh, mistreated and abused and beaten and locked up in prison, they still prayed and they still sang songs to God and they still went after God. They sought after him. And as they did that, then immediately happened. See, we want immediately to happen in our life, but we don't want to go through the process that prepares for the immediately. And the process is what's creating space for the immediately in your life. The breakthrough happens not just when God gets ready to zap it. The breakthrough happens when we've walked through the process that prepared the ground for the immediately. You know, at some point in time, everything that's ever happened, at some point in time, it happened, but there was a long, probably under the surface process that, that allowed there to be room for that immediately in your life. Like this is, this is uh, something just to, just to make it practical for you. You know, there's a lot of, a lot of people that'll tell you that if you, uh, if you will, you know, show up and you'll tithe, then, you know, you're going to wake up one morning this week and go out and check the mail and there's going to be a, you know, thousand dollar check in there. And, and there's jokers on TV that'll tell you this stuff. And I want you to know that is not the kind of immediately that God works in. He establishes things to work in immediately. Yes, he does do things immediately. But he also works within the law of sowing and reaping. And you and I know just as good as anybody else that when you put a seed in the ground, you, you, you're going to have to wait a few minutes. You know what I mean? You're going to have to wait a minute. You're going to have to, you're going to, have to trust the process. You're going to have to trust the process that God is going to, and there is going to be a day when that thing springs up. But it didn't just spring up. There was something going on beneath the surface long before you ever saw it on the top side. You get what I'm saying? By faith, this scripture is, is bringing us here. When he was tested, Abraham, when he was tested, this testing is what is preparing for immediately. Okay? So the test is preparing for immediately. Watch what it says, though. When he was tested, he offered up Isaac... And he who had received the promises offered up his only begotten son of whom it was said in Isaac, your seed shall be called concluding that God was able to raise him up even from the dead from which he also received him in a figurative sense. Now, if you're familiar with that story, uh, you, that makes sense to you probably. But if not, then we're going to talk about that here in just a minute. But I want us to go back for just a minute. And I, I want to look at some things from the life of Abraham and ways that Abraham was tested. And I, I feel like this is going to be encouraging to some of you because some of you are walking through some testings in your life and you don't even recognize that they're testings. But I want to show you some of the ways that Abraham was tested and the reasoning, the reason for Abraham's testing and the immediately that were provided for him because he passed the test. OK, so Abraham was tested. So let's turn back to the book of Genesis, all the way back to the beginning in chapter 12. Genesis chapter 12. Verse one. Now the Lord had said to Abram. Now at this time, Abraham is just Abram. Later, God changes his name and that's another sermon for another day. Same guy. Now the Lord had said to Abram, get out of your country from your family and from your father's house to a land that I will show you. I will make you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great and you shall be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and I will curse him who curses you. And in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. This is the promise that initiates what we know of as the land or the nation of Israel. They came from this conversation that a man named Abram had with God. Now, here's a good question for you. If Abram hadn't gotten out of his father's country and gone to the land that God would show him, where would we be today? I think God would have just raised up somebody else. But because this man was faithful and because this man believed God, he's accounted in the book of Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 11, as a man of faith. He's in the hall of faith. And he says that Abraham, 
when he was tested, he gave God what God asked for. What did God ask him for here? I want to show you this first way that he was tested. He was tested in Genesis chapter 12. We just read it. He was tested in the way of letting go. First time we see Abraham pop up on the scene, he has to let go. You see, you need to know a little bit of the backstory. And I don't want to get too caught up in this because I can chase some rabbits here. But Abram has a father who, um, if if you go back and you read about his father's name was Terah. And... Terah, it says this in verse 27 of chapter 11, he, or Genesis eleven twenty-seven 27 says, this is the genealogy of Terah. Terah begot Abram, Nahor, and Haran, and Haran begot Lot. So Abram has two brothers, one named Nahor and one named Haran. And Haran died before his father Terah in his native land in Ur of the Chaldeans. And then Abram and Nahor took wives. The name of Abram's wife was Sarai, and the name of Nahor's was Milcah. And uh, go down to verse 30. But Sarai was barren. She had no child. And Terah uh, took his son Abram and his grandson Lot, the son of Haran, and his daughter-in-law Sarai, his son Abram's wife. And they went out with them from Ur the Chaldeans to go to the land of Canaan. And they came to Haran and dwelt there. So the days of Terah were 205 years and Terah died in Haran. Now let me give you a little bit of what's going on here. Abram has has two brothers, right? One of them's name is Haran. And the other one's name is, uh, what was his name? Nahor. Their father's name is Terah, all right? Terah is heading, he's taking his family where? They're on a journey. They left the land of the Chaldeans and they're on their journey. They're taking the whole family to Canaan. That's what it says on their way to Canaan and somewhere along the way in a little spot, they stopped maybe for the night in a land, in a place called Haran and the brother of Abraham dies and Abram's brother dies in a place called Haran. And it, the Bible says that then Terah, the father stopped moving toward Canaan and he settled in Haran and he died there. You see what it says? It says, so the days of Terah were 205 years and Terah died in Haran. Where was he headed? Canaan. What's Canaan? Canaan is the promised land. Canaan, that's, that's where we're headed next week. Week after the next. He's headed to Canaan, but he stopped in Haran. And as it just so happens, like I had to look at this a few times. Haran just so happens to be the name of the brother that dies. And he stops in a place called Haran and the brother dies in a place called Haran. And, and this, this place, I don't know if it was called Haran before, but after this brother dies there, it's called Haran. This father named this place after something he lost. And it kept him, he stopped from moving forward into the promise that God had made to him. I believe that, that we, we, the song could have been like this. Father Terah had many sons. Many sons had Father Terah. But Terah stopped in her aunt. And so God rose, raised up another, Abraham. That's why we say, Father Abraham had many sons. When it was Abraham's father that was supposed to go. You, you get what I'm saying? So what had to happen was whenever Terah stopped in the place of loss. Some of you have lost Loved ones, some of you have lost friendships, some of you have lost, you felt uh, things have been torn from your life. You've, you've, there's been, there's been uh, some of it tragic, some of it just, just through uh, dysfunction, some of it through, you know, some sort of uh, something, something has stolen from you. And that sense of loss has the potential to paralyze you in a place called Haran. And it is not God's promise. It is not God's best. It is not where God wants you to end up. It's not there. And, and until we get, get released from that land of loss, we will never see the land flowing with God's promise and God's blessing. There is something that God wants to bring you into, but if you don't get past what you lost, you'll never see it. Terah died in a place that God never intended for him to die. 
I, I don't want to, I'm not, I just, I'm speaking for myself. Maybe this is a message for me. I don't want to die somewhere that God never intended me to die. I want to be right where God intends for me to be. I want to have everything God says I can have. I want to do everything God says I can do. I want to live it to the fullest. I want to be, I want to be like, like uh, one of these patriarchs that, that, that has my name in a hall of faith somewhere that says he lived it. He did it. He went there. He gave it. He bit, he, he was a part of it. He saw it with his eyes. He didn't just think it was going to happen one day, but then he settled in a place of loss and he missed it. I don't want to live there, guys. I want us to go somewhere that God has promised us to go. I want you to get where God has called you to be. I want you to have everything God says you can have. I don't want you to settle for that place of loss because you'll die there and you'll regret it. How many people have died in places of loss and they've regretted it over their lives? And it was a terrible thing that happened. He lost a son, man. No, no father should bury, have to bury his son. A son should bury a father. It shouldn't work this way. But somewhere in this dysfunctional world, we have things that happen that can slow us down and can stall us out and can keep us from God's very best for our lives if we allow it to. So the first thing that I see about Abram is he's being called to go somewhere that a generation before him was stuck in. He's being called to go further than what a generation before him was willing to go. And I want you to know, like, there is something to this. Like, I, I want to live the kind of life that leaves a legacy of going for it for my children and for the future generation. That they don't just look and, and, and see, uh, you know, a, 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 a strategy for how to stop, but a, how, to, how to launch. I want, I want to leave a legacy that says go for it, not settle. And, and Abraham hears from the Lord and he says, I want you to get out of your father's house. Why? Because he's in your father's house. You're settled. You're, 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 you're stuck. You're paralyzed. You're complacent. He says, it's time to move into my promise. This time, he didn't even know where he was going. His father was going to Canaan. Evidently, the plan was clear. God had, had ever, at some point in time spoken to Abraham's father, Terah, and told him, you're going to Canaan, specifically Canaan. So he's headed that way, loses his son, and he stops. Abraham gets this word from the Lord. We just read it. Get out of your country and from your family and your father's house to a land I will show you. He doesn't even name it. He says, a land I will show you. I will, you're going to see it. You're not going to get stuck along the way. You're going to see it. We sang that song this morning. I don't know how, how much you, you think about this, but a lot of times, man, there's just such significance in the things that we're singing and preparing our hearts for what the word of the Lord is to us for today. But we sang that I believe this. I believe this. I'm going to see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. We'll see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. I'll sing that all the days of my life because I believe he's not just called me to think it's coming one day, but he's called me to see it today. He said, I will show you this land. I will show it to you. So the first way that Abraham was tested was the letting go. He had to let go. He had to let go. Man, that's, that's a word for somebody in here. It's time to let go of some things. It's time to let go of some people even. It's time to let go of some stuff. It's time to let go because you can't move into the promise still holding on to what you're holding on to. If he's calling you to let it go, you better let it go and get your feet moving. Say, I don't know where we're going. I don't know what it's going to look like. I think a lot of times it's not a question of whether or not we're, we're worried about will God pr you know, provide or will God you know, eventually bring us into it. But I just don't know if we really believe he's good. I don't know if we truly believe how good he is, because if we really believed how good he was, he wouldn't even have to tell us that it's Canaan. He would just say, I'll show you when you get there. See, but we want to have all this figured out. Well, it's got to look like this and it's got to be this and we got to have this. And, and it, it, if we if we can't see that it's good enough, no, his word is good enough. And if he said it's good, then it's going to be beyond anything I could imagine anyway. If he said it's good, then I'm going. I don't have to know what it's called and I don't have to know what it looks like. He said, it's good. It's going to be good. Amen. Quit trying to figure everything out and just trust him. God, I know you're doing something and I'm saying it's, it's good. So I'm just going, I'm going the letting go, the testing of the letting go of the familiar and the comfortable. 
This is, a, this is another, another part that, see, the religious spirit will a lot of times get, you know, attached to uh, an individual or a corporate body of believers or even a church. A religious spirit will try to keep you locked and contained inside of what's familiar and comfortable. I, I had, a, I had a, probably one of the, I led worship a couple of times this last week while I was out. And the first uh, night that I led worship was probably one of the most uncomfortable times of worship I've ever been in in my life. And it wasn't because I felt like it was just like boom, powerful, you know what I mean? Just like amazing. It was just like, I couldn't find the flow and I just couldn't, I mean, I just, could, I don't know. I, I, it was just, it was a strange situation. But you know, something that we've become familiar with, even if it's a good thing, can stop you from the best things. You, you get what I'm saying? Like something we become too familiar with, if it's just like comfortable to us. And that's why I want to be careful, man, that we don't come into this house and, and, and just because we, we've done this so many times now and we've sang these songs before and, and we know them by heart. We don't have to read it off the screen anymore, man. I know that song. And, and it just becomes familiar and comfortable to us to the degree that we're not, we're not even movable anymore by it. That God can't take us to another level, to another realm, because we're just stuck in what's familiar and what's comfortable and what's, what's secure to us. Predictable. God says, I'm going to take you out of some predictability in your life. I'm going to take you out of some things that are predictable in your life, and I'm going to move you into some things that may seem a little bit uncomfortable, but it's in those places of being uncomfortable that God says, I'm going to promote you and put you into a new realm and into a new level. He's calling us to a new level on an individual basis, but it's not going to come so long as we are comfortable in the familiarity of life. He called Abram out and he said, this is not going to look like what you've been in, but it's good. You guys still with me? So flip over a page if it's, on the, if it's on the next page in your Bible. Mine it is. Just to verse 10 there, still in chapter 12 of Genesis, verse 10. Now Abram, he gets to where God's taken him. And it says, now there was a famine in the land and Abram went down to Egypt to dwell there for the famine was severe in the land. So God gets him to Canaan and Abram takes a look around and he goes, man, this place stinks. I mean, it's dry. I mean, there's not, I mean, what? I just had something else in mind. And he's looking around going, man, this is, this is, this is not good. It's a famine. It was so severe. He was like, you know what? I'm just going to keep moving. And he leaves the place of promise because it didn't look like what he thought it was going to look like. Because you see, Abram at this point in time had mixed up the idea of what suddenlies look like. And he had forgotten the fact that he wasn't just called to a land to enjoy it, but he was called to a land to redeem it. He forgot that he wasn't just called to be uh, somebody that goes and dwells in a place, but he's called to be somebody that goes and takes back the place that had been lost to the famine. And see, there's something in this that we need to get. If, if we're not letting go of the familiar and the comfortable, we'll never see God's promise. But if we get to a, a, a new place in God and a new place in our spiritual journey with him, and it doesn't look like what we thought it would, then we, we, at the same time, we've got to learn how to see it correctly. The second way that, that Abram, and I know there's probably a lot more, and I'm not trying to be exhaustive with this today, but I'm just giving you a couple of things. The second way that I see that Abram was tested in his journey was he wasn't just tested in letting go, but he was also tested in seeing correctly. Many of you noticed I'm, I'm, I'm seeing a little better these days. And, and I, one thing that I figured out, <laughs> do, I, do I look strange now? See, everybody now says, and you look weird without the glasses. So I look weird with them or without them. Okay, that's just how it is. But here's, here's, the, here's the truth. I didn't realize how off my vision was until I saw correctly. And then I, and because I mean, I was content to live with the blur. Yeah, you know what I'm talking about. Those of you that are wearing these things, you know what I'm talking about. I was content to live with the blur. But once I saw clearly, I realized 
how dysfunctional the vision was. At this point in the, the story, in the journey of Abram, he's still not seeing correctly. There's a famine in the land. It's blurry. It's, it's, it's dry. It's, it, it's, it's a wilderness. And he goes down to Egypt, just to paraphrase the story a little bit here. He goes down to Egypt. He gets in trouble. God shows up and faithfully gently brings him out of the mess that he got himself in. You can go read this for yourself sometime. I don't have time today. Then we get into chapter 13 and and it says this, that after the Lord rescued him out of Egypt, I mean, he could have gone to Egypt and been killed. But it it, it says this in in, uh, chapter 13, verse three, it says, and he went on his journey from the south as far as Bethel to the place where his tent had been at the beginning between Bethel and Ai to the place of the altar, which he had made there at first. Now stop right there for a second. What happened? God brought correction to his vision. Now think about this. Last thing, this is the same place, okay? Same place. God was, God brought him to the land of promise, the promised land, the land that he promised him in Genesis 12, 1. And then when he gets there, Abraham looks around and he goes, man, this place is terrible. I'm getting out of here. And he goes down to Egypt. And then the next thing you know, he's coming back to the place after God likes, is, you know, sets him back on course. He brings clarity to him. And now listen to his description of the land. To the place of the altar, which he had made there at first. But back up to verse 3. I'm sorry. He went on his journey from the south as far as Bethel to the place where his tent had been at the beginning between Bethel and Ai. He was, he was brought back. That, even that, that word Bethel there, it literally means the house of God. It, he, was, he was being brought back to a, a, a place now, not being l- looked at through the lens of famine, but being looked at through the potential of who might be here in this place. Even though it doesn't look right, it doesn't look like it's coming together in the natural. I know God's in this place. And I think this is the point that God's bringing some of us to in here. And we've got to get to the place where we can look at our lives and our situation. Maybe it's even your finances. This is the test. The test is, is when you can look at the bank account and you can go, okay, there's not enough in there to do this, 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 and this. Do I trust God? Do I tithe? Do I sow that seed he's telling me to sow? Do I give like God's telling me to give? Do I do what God's telling me to do? Or do I try to manage this famine over here? Depends on how you see it. Depends on how you see it. But so long as you're seeing it as a famine, it will continue to be a famine. It says this to the place of the altar that he had made there at first. And there Abraham called on the name of the Lord. Abram, I'm sorry. I get it. Same guy. Abraham. He called on the name of the Lord. Where? At the place of the altar. There are some things, man, I'm going to go Pastor Greg on you here for just a second. There are some things that God wants to alter in us that without the altar, the place of the altar, it doesn't get altered. There's some changes, there's some shifts, there's some things God wants to change in your circumstances, in the family. He wants to deal with the fruitlessness of our lives. He wants to deal with the famine in our families. He wants to deal with the famine in our city. He wants to deal with the famine in this country. But until we come to the place of the altar, all we can do is observe the famine. See, the second way Abraham was tested was in seeing it correctly. You can never see it correctly from a place of the the view of the famine, but you can see it correctly from the place of the altar. He's going to come to another altar here in a little bit. And I don't have time to get into it today, so maybe there'll be a part two in this later. But he was tested in this place to provoke him to be and to go and to do everything that God had for him to be and to go and to do. And there's some things in our lives that we are currently, I mean, I I would say this about myself. And if you're honest in here, you'd say this about yourself too. I am not there yet. And there are things I know that are, that God has for me that I, I could be and probably should be walking in today, but I'm not. 
There, and, and I could be, I could play some sort of, um, you know, uh, I'm not responsible card and kick the can down the road and say, well, it's just because God hadn't done it yet. Or I could realize that he's not just wanting to be the God that was or the God that will be. He wants to be the God that is today. He wants to deal with this thing so that he can make me who I'm supposed to be. Not later, but now. See, because if you're, if you're looking around and waiting for the famine to stop before you get real with God, you're, you're going to miss the whole point because the whole point was never to get the famine to stop. The point was to get you to the altar. And if we get to the altar, the famine is going to be dealt with out of the overflow of what God does at the altar. You get, you get what I'm saying? I hope you're getting this, man. Some, some of it's a little bit, you know, deep. I understand that. But there's something that's out there, I'm telling you. And it's not just for later, it's for now. But it's negligence that has kept us from walking in the fullness of it now. It's negligence. And we've, and we've justified the negligence by saying, well, it's just not time for that yet. And I'm telling you, that's a lie. It's absolutely a lie. We, we want to talk, we talk about it one day and it drives me crazy. And I, I love prophetic people, man. I, I mean, I, I love being around people that, that speak the word of the Lord and what's God saying for today and, and whatever. But I, man, I'm, I think it's great to talk about what we believe God's saying he's going to do in 10 years or whatever. But what's he want to do today? What's he want to do today? And to be honest with you, I've heard enough prophecies about revival that's coming in 10 years. I want to know about the revival that's coming today. You hear what I'm saying? I want to know what is God want to do today because it's not about what he's going to do tomorrow. It's about what is he doing today? Tomorrow becomes today. Today. Tomorrow becomes today. Today. It's a good title. We always, after services, we always try to figure out, what are we going to call this sermon today? And before they post them on YouTube, we don't, and most of the time, Brother Levi back there has a better, better ear to it than I do. So, all right, man, I got so much more I could get into this. I feel like it's, it's, he's laying a foundation though. Amen. You receive that? You receive that? Baby, will you come up here and get on the keys for me for just a minute? I want to, I want to invite you to, to make a move on something. There's two, two things we talked about today. One, the hindrance of not letting go. Amen. Two, the deception of not seeing correctly. I deal with both of these issues on an ongoing basis. I, I, I deal with it every, on, a sun, on a Sunday morning. It's like this. I can look around this room and be honest with you, like I look around this room and it's probably about, you know, half full. I see more gray chairs than I do people. And, and, and what, 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 what tends to happen to me as a leader is, is, uh, is I'll come to this point where I'll look at it and I'll go, man, what's, what's the deal? Like, what's up with this famine? Why do I see more gray chairs than I do people? And something in me has to go through this war to decide how I'm going to see it. Because how I see it determines how God can move in it. Because I'm telling you, anything that you see the wrong way is, is, is preventing you from being able to allow God to move in that situation. And the truth is, is that there's probably some people that should be sitting in these gray chairs that are not currently sitting in these gray chairs because some of us have not been able to see these gray chairs pr properly. Amen. Amen. You, you get what I'm saying? And there's some things in your life that work the exact same way. This is, this is, huh, man, I don't want to like get all up in your business, but you, you allow the Lord to apply that to you. There's, there's some stuff you're looking at wrong. And I'm telling you, you can't judge this thing on, on the natural. You can't base things in your life on the, 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 the natural circumstances that you live. You will be, you will be a, a depressed. If, if, you, if you base your life on how the world's going, come on, on how things are happening around you, man, you're going to be a mess. 
There's a whole lot of people that are walking around with a whole lot of dysfunction and it's really not their fault. It's just because they live in a famine and they can't see beyond it. You know, there was a study done years, uh, years ago. I remember reading about this and uh, I think they called it the broken window theory. Y'all ever heard of that before? They, and, and there was this, this, uh, this study that went into some of the worst neighborhoods and some of the, the most crime ridden uh, cities in America. They went into some of the worst neighborhoods and some of the worst environments where, you know, there was always stuff going down, you know, just, just, you know, darkness. And, and they went into these, these, these places and they just went in and started cleaning up the facades of buildings, pressure washing, painting and fixing the broken windows. That's all they did. They went in, they fixed the broken windows of the buildings and they started cleaning things up a little bit and that, that was it. And then they sat back and they watched it for a year. And they watched how dramatically crime just nosedived in those communities. And, and, and uh, reports of violent crime just like, just tanked. Why? People started seeing it different. People started seeing their environment differently. You, you getting what I'm saying? The broken window, it, 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 it wasn't like that actually had any impact on whether or not somebody was going to stab somebody that day. But there was something about the environment that changed when somebody said, let's clean this up and let's deal with this part of this. And maybe that will overflow into the other areas of dysfunction in this world. I'm telling you, there are issues in our country right now that cannot be solved by po politicians and they cannot be fixed by those people that, 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 are, that are just trying to, 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 to manage this thing well. Well, it's only going to be fixed when a few people start seeing it correctly. And as we see it correctly, it has the potential to influence the entire atmosphere of our nation. This is why it's so dangerous, man. Don't get caught up in the media. Don't get caught up in what's the talking heads out there and what they're jabbering about. And all, because I'm telling you, if you do that, you're going to see everything wrong. You're going to see everything through a broken window. And all is it going to, all it's going to do is fuel the dysfunction that everybody else is living in, in you. So you got to be careful. If, if you start seeing things through the lens of the, the kingdom of God, then you begin to see things differently. The dysfunction actually looks like hope. You actually see potential. You actually see God able to do something somewhere that nobody else has any hope for anymore in the lives of people that others have given up on and in the hearts of even, even maybe even in yourself. Because see, ultimately, this isn't about everybody else. It's about you. It's not about everybody else. It's about you. And if, if God can cause me to see myself differently, Maybe it might just change some of the ways I do things. Maybe if God can change the way I see myself, maybe, maybe I won't say some of the things I don't need to say and do some of the things I don't need to do. Maybe it'll actually begin to change some things because I see it right. When I see myself, this is, this is why Paul was adamant. And you go read through, I mean, I, I, I could pick a... A thousand of them through Ephesians and Galatians and, and first and second Corinthians, a book of Romans. Go read Romans chapter five. My, my goodness, we are the righteousness of Christ. He's trying to get us to see it different. And when you see it different, it affects things on the outside. Perspective shift. It changes things. So number one, it's a challenge of letting go. Number two, it's a challenge of seeing it right. God, give us your perspective. God, help me to see this correctly in my life. Because these are areas that God wants to bring freedom and the immediately's are going to come. Come on, the immediately's are going to come. They're, those immediately's are going to be in the breakout in your life. You're going to have immediately's even this week as you begin to see these things differently and as you begin to let go of some other things. There is a process that God's bringing us through that is provoking the immediately's in your life. And this is how we do it. So if you can receive that word today, I want to pray for you. And I, I, I realize not everybody in this room can receive that, but I want you, if you were here today and that was a word for you, then you just need to be in receive mode right now and hear this as we pray. Lord, only you can do this. 
shift by your spirit, Lord. Every perspective that is hindering every perspective that is keeping us from the altar, every perspective that's preventing us from moving forward in you, every self-sabotaging perspective that we've permitted to remain in our eyes, Lord, we ask you to remove it today in Jesus' name. And Lord, I pray for a grace to be released The grace for letting go. The grace for letting go. The grace for leaning on you. The grace for seeing it correctly. And the grace to take what is in famine. To find the altar there. And to trust you. It's without faith it's impossible to please God. For he that comes to him must first believe that he is. He is. He is. He, hear this by the Spirit today. He is. He is. Most of us spend our entire lives wanting to know. Is God willing we know that he's able, but is God willing? And I feel this need to release this to you. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6. He who comes to him must believe that he is. Is he willing? He is. He's not just the one who was and who is to come. He is. And he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. So Lord, may your grace be upon your people today. Lord, to let go of the past, to let go of those places of loss, those places of failure, those places of falling. Lord, I declare over them now freedom to move on. And Lord, that they would take steps in the direction that you lead them in with a confident hope knowing that you are bringing them into a land flowing with milk and honey, a place of promise. And even if it doesn't look like they thought it was going to look, God, we trust you and we believe that in this place, Lord, you will cause us to be a blessing, Lord, that a blessing to all the world, that we would actually be a blessing to the world. The world would be blessed through us. And Lord, today, as we come before you, Lord, as, as Abram did in the wilderness that day, Father, we say, I will go and I will see it right. I will follow you wherever you lead me. Come on, just, just pray this with me. Say, Lord, I will go. I'll go wherever you lead me. I'll follow you when I don't understand. When I don't see where we're going. I'll have it when you say I'll have it. I'll do it when you say I'll do it. And I believe that the best is yet to come. And I will see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Come on, thank him for that. Praise the Lord. Amen.